Hi, I'm Phil. I joined the W.P. Carey School as a lecturer last August. Before then, I'd been writing and speaking. Before that, I'd been consulting. And I joke with my colleagues that I can't imagine having a worse background for, uh, at least educational background, for what I do. Um, you know, I kind of uh, enjoy t telling my students that you may get into a particular job or technology now, and in five years you might say, wow, didn't think I'd be here. So I did not think I'd be here at this point in my life, but anyway, I want to start off by making this fun. It works better with a bigger crowd, but go ahead if you would and everyone get on up. I'd like to start talks like this with an experiment. By the way, who, who's with me here? Who? Wait, uh, who's the artist? Yeah. Got the first thing, James Brown, thank you, thank you. All right, go ahead and have a seat if you own any products from a little company called Amazon or you use Amazon service. I get you all? Really? Anyone standing? Nope? All right, I didn't even have to go through Apple or Facebook or Google. I did this talk in, what was it, October of 2011 in Washington, D.C. There were 300 people there. And I went through Amazon, most people sat down, maybe 50%, 60%, and went through Apple. By the time I got to Facebook, there was only one guy standing. Asked him if he used Google, said no, still standing. The moderator said, I have a question for the guy standing up. What cave do you live in? <laughs> oh, I find it interesting that most people use one or more of those companies' products and services. And as I thought about it around 2011, it occurred to me that these companies were following a similar business model. But I wasn't the only one thinking this. Not long after I started researching the book, I found out about a video from this guy. Eric Schmidt, executive chairman of Google. Eric? Schmidt, at the time, chairman of the board of Google, or chief executive, I believe, essentially validated the premise of the book I was working on, and he's a particularly smart guy. Needless to say, I felt pretty good about the book that I was writing. And he mentions platforms, and as Brittany had mentioned, I have a bit of a complicated relationship with that word. So here's his quote, there are four companies that are exploiting platform strategies really well. Well, just what is a platform? Well, we know from what he said that Amazon, Apple, Facebook, and Google are doing things that kind of make a platform. But again, I have a bit of a problem with the term. What does it really mean? It gets used so frequently. My most recent book is called Message Not Received. I think we use way too much jargon in email. And that near the top of my list of, jar of business jargon is this notion of a platform, right? What is it? I think if you talk to 10, diff 10 different people, you'll get 10 different answers. Right? Well, the, way, the way that I defined it in the book, yes, it's a really big buzzword. Right? It's almost meaningless to me. Right? I've heard companies call themselves platforms, and I'll show you a few examples of them. I think if they're platforms, <laughs> then just about anything is. Right? Oh, when you think about business jargon, Here's one that I like from Dilbert. 
cloud computing, that's another one that gets thrown around a lot. Blah, 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 platform. We hear a lot about platforms these days. Does anyone know who Paul Graham is? No? Entrepreneurs? Paul Graham is one of the co-founders of Y Combinator. It's one of the big firms that invests in companies. So, according to him, at Young Y Combinator, roughly 30% of companies are branding themselves as some sort of platform. I used to live in Las Vegas. When you think Las Vegas, what do you immediately think? Casinos. Those casinos are huge. A lot of conferences in these casinos, right? Yeah, people are gambling, but a lot of conferences. Went to one maybe two years ago and I met a startup founder. So tell me about your company. He says, oh, we're a gift experience platform. My response, so tell me about your company. What is a gift experience platform? I have no idea. Who here knows what Bitly is? Nobody? Link shortener, you can do tracking, analytics. No one knows Bitly. So rather than sending to someone, someone to philsimon.com forward slash books forward slash the age of the platform, right? It could be just a Bitly, right? Bitly doesn't think of itself as a link shortening service. That would be too prosaic. No, no, no. It is a link management platform. What? Uh, this is one of my favorites, um, Apticals, some kind of startup, uh, motion, mobile publishing platform. And let's not forget LifeRay, the digital experience platform. What? I, I don't know what these things even mean. Okay. Well, my book came out in 2011 and a few reviews called it seminal. It's not a bad thing to hear if you're writing a book. But many other books have come out on platforms, right? Here are just a few of them. In fact, um, I know the guy who wrote uh, Platform Revolution. So platforms are very popular, but I still don't know what they are, right? Because people use that term in such a fluid way. It essentially has lost all meaning to me, right? Well, as I argue in this book, it's a fundamentally powerful and new business model that scores of a company, companies have adopted. I could talk to you about the gang of four, Amazon, Apple, Facebook, and Google, but other companies have embraced platform thinking. Who here is on Twitter? Anyone? Okay. I'm going to give you some examples in a bit about how Twitter has truly embr embraced platform thinking. Ditto for LinkedIn. Ditto for Salesforce.com. Ditto for who here is on WordPress? Anyone ever mess around with WordPress? With WordPress, right, you can download the software for free. It's open source. But on WordPress, are you restricted to what the company behind it automatic puts out? No. What can you do on WordPress? based on what you need to customize it. Right. You can take advantage of developers who are out there building plugins, building themes, right? tapping into APIs. That, to me, is a true platform. But we're going to get to that in a minute. Right. So most companies these days understand that technology matters. In fact, something really interesting happened on July 29th, 2016. For the first time, the five most valuable companies According to Wall Street, we're tech companies. Anyone know what the most valuable company is then for a book? Apple. Apple. Yeah. We'll get to that. Apple was number one. Enjoy the book. So Apple, this was what, five years after this book came out? Anyone want to guess what number two was? No, one quite number two. You already got a book. Yeah, Google. Right? Google, well, technically it's now Alphabet, which is a holding company. Google split itself up. But Alphabet was number two. Anyone number, th number three? Not yet. We're getting there. Close. No, oh, not even close. It is Microsoft. You, <laughs> you can't get one more one book. Microsoft. Right? And who, who's number four? You already said it. Amazon. Okay. Incidentally, Facebook was number four. We'll talk about Twitter's value in a minute. It's nowhere close. Um, have a very long discussion about Twitter. But the five most valuable companies were, were tech companies, right? And in its own way, Microsoft is embracing platform thinking. I would not put 
Microsoft in the same vein as the other ones, even though it's very valuable because as Eric Schmidt said, Amazon, Apple, Facebook, and Google are primarily consumer companies, but lines are starting to blur, right? Some of you, you have a Microsoft Surface tablet, right? It used to be, not that long ago, that you would only buy a Microsoft product if you had to, not because you wanted to, right? You bought Windows or you bought Office because you worked, and those were the standards in companies. Right? You really, with the exception of Xbox, you wouldn't go out and willingly buy a Microsoft product. That's starting to change. So let's get back to platforms. They embrace what economists call multi-sided markets. Right? If you go into a Target, who here has ever been to a Target? Right? Are you buying something or are you selling something? You're buying. Do you go up to the manager at a Target, say, hey, I got something, you want to buy it? They can't buy it. They have their approved distribution channels. What about on Amazon? Has anyone ever sold anything on Amazon before? Right. So it's what economists would call multi-sided. If you want to buy songs on iTunes, you can do that. If you want to put your songs in iTunes to sell, you can do that. Multi-sided. You can sell books on Amazon. You can develop apps for Facebook and sell on them. So again, it's a multi-sided market. In the book, I write about this notion of big P versus little p. Operating systems have been around for a long time, right? Going back to when I first had a computer, you could purchase an operating system, and there were programs that ran on it, but those really weren't fundamental to the company's business models, right? Anyone know how much money Apple alone has paid out to developers? Think big. Last time I checked, it was over $50 billion. Right. So they're embracing, they want people to develop, much like WordPress, their core products and services and take them in interesting directions. And a little bit later, I'm going to show you some really interesting examples. In the book, I also argue that a platform is what I call an integrated set of planks. Right. Amazon just used to sell books. Right. When Jeff Bezos quit his job in 1994 as a hedge fund, he could not believe that the internet was growing at, get this, a rate of 2,800% per month. Now when you grow that big, I'm sorry, that fast, little things become big things really quickly. And Bezos decided to start Amazon.com because there was no way to buy a book online. So Amazon clearly proved that it had a viable business model selling books online, but then what else did Amazon sell after books? 1995, 1996, I know some of you weren't even born yet. But what's a similar product to a book in many ways? CDs, very good. What else? Movies, DVDs, or back then we had VHS as well. Sorry? Yeah, music, CDs, so maybe some records or other types. So it wasn't that strange for Amazon having mastered books to be like, well, what's kind of similar to a book, right? If you know that you want a particular book, do you have to feel it? Do you have to touch it? Not necessarily. I mean, now you can even buy shoes online with Zappos, which, by the way, anyone knows uh, what company acquired Zappos? Amazon. $1.1 billion, I think it was, about four years ago. So they're planks. They're integrated. I'm going to give you an example later, but when I log into Amazon to buy a book, I don't have to log in someplace else to buy a CD. Right? In fact, and as Amazon, getting back to this notion of multi-sided markets, I could buy things on Amazon, I do, quite frequently. I can sell things on Amazon, I do. Right? There are all sorts of different ways that you can do things on Amazon. Right? In fact, has anyone ever done Fulfilled by Amazon? No? I have a couple of friends who do this. They use Amazon to basically warehouse all of their stuff because they don't want to go into the post office every day. So Amazon's figured out ways to bring people in. When I think about companies that brand themselves as platforms, I ask myself a very simple question. What can I, as a developer, build on top of it? Right? In other words, are you using application programming interfaces or APIs, and do you promote software development kits or SDKs? So a link management platform or a gift experience platform means nothing to me, because what can I, as a developer, do with it? The most powerful platforms out there, the ones that I write about in the book, allow third-party developers to take it in interesting directions. Now, has anyone ever built an app before? Yeah? Android, iOS? Android. Android? Okay. 
So Android is say, or at Google, which actually bought Android. I think it was 1.2 billion, and it was an Israeli company. And then they decided to give it away because in 2007, when Apple, with Steve Jobs, launched the iPhone, the Google guys knew that that changed everything. Well, even Steve Jobs, who initially had said, "I don't want developers mucking around with my stuff," recognized that there was so much power out there. There were so many amazing ideas. Apple didn't have them all. Anyone know how many times Angry Birds has been downloaded? It's been the millions or the so, last time I checked, it was over two billion. Steve Jobs was an incredibly smart guy. I don't see how he could possibly have predicted that. So, I mentioned before that true platforms allowed third party developers through APIs and SDKs to take their core product in interesting directions. And we often don't know what those results will be. I asked you before who's on Twitter? Show of hands. Okay. Anyone know what this is if you're on Twitter? This is a product that Twitter bought in 2010, I believe, called TweetDeck. Twitter's core product fails the mom test. Who here's mother is on Facebook? Decent number of you. Moms get Facebook, right? It makes sense. Oh, I can keep in touch with people. Twitter fails the mom test. You look at the core Twitter product and you go, I don't know what I'm looking at, right? It's like the movie The Matrix. Anyone ever see that? You look at the beginning and the data is just flying at you. You can't make any sense of it. So let's talk about TweetDeck. Founders of TweetDeck realized that there was an opportunity to take this morass of information, this interminable flow of tweets, which made absolutely no sense, and let you segment it. I use something similar now called Hootsuite. So I can track at Phil Simon or hashtag big data or list of my favorite sports teams or whatever I want. Create my own streams that help me make sense of this terrible stream of information. Twitter bought TweetDeck for $40 million in 2010. Why they have not integrated it into its core offering is absolutely beyond me. Now, most products or startups don't have anywhere near the results that the folks from TweetDeck had, right? $40 million, that's not too bad, right? In fact, I think it was 2011 when I was researching the book, I discovered that there were a million apps at the time written for Twitter tapping into the API, a million. Let's say that 95% of them suck. They don't work, they're redundant, they're confusing. Throw away 95% of them. That means 50,000 potentially useful ideas with Twitter. Platform thinking at its finest. I'd give you away a book, but I don't have any more. Anyone know who this is? Okay. This is Jordan Rudess. He's an incredibly talented, classically trained pianist, and he's also uh, the keyboardist for one of my favorite bands, Dream Theater. No Dream Theater fans, I would imagine, right? He definitely has a distinct look about him. Why am I talking about him? Because when he's not playing for Dream Theater or doing concerts on the side, he runs a small company, bless you, called Wisdom Music. Rudess was one of the first people to embrace this idea of a keyboard back in the 70s. Right? He thinks that there are ways to create apps for the iPad, and he does that. And he'll play them on stage for 5,000 people at a time. How are you making those sounds? Well, it's my app. He's got a bunch of them. In effect, he's marketing his app. And remember, Apple takes a 30% cut. So he's, in a way, making Apple money just by doing his job. And Apple is encouraging this, right? I think it's $99 for an Apple developer's license. But then they take 30% of the VIG, which I think is completely reasonable, right? And that 70-30 that split is actually quite common. Wait, Google does, I believe, the same thing with Google Play. So this is just one crazy idea that came out of this notion of an ecosystem. Anyone know who this is? I'll give you a hint. She's a self-publishing rock star. Okay, this is Amanda Hawking. Amazon lets prospective authors put their books out there because I can tell you getting a book deal from a traditional publisher isn't easy. And you could say, but I'm really smart and I write really well. Do you think they care? What do they care about? Do they think it's going to make money? Absolutely. They care about whether or not you can sell books. That's the 
dirty little secret of the publishing industry. So unless you have sold books, they don't want to talk to you. Well, it turns out that Amanda Hawking, by self-publishing her short, uh, kind of teen vampire type twilight things, not really my particular band of vodka, on Amazon was making over $150,000 per year. Publishers started to take notice. Because again, not that she's not a good writer, never read any of her stuff, but she proved that she could sell books. She ultimately inked a $2 million deal with St. Martin's Press. So again, just another example of platform thinking going in a random direction. Anyone know who this is? He wouldn't be happy. Mark Pincus is actually, I think he came back, um, a CEO of Zynga. Anyone ever play a game on Zynga? Those annoying feeds and with Facebook notifications for Mafia Wars, right? Um, wasn't a huge gamer, but to me this was astonishing. At what point Zynga was worth over a billion dollars? Facebook launched a company. Now, Zynga has kind of spread off on its own a bit, but for a long time you could only play Zynga games while logged into Facebook. So Facebook spawned its own billion dollar separate company. Again, platform thinking. They benefit tremendously from network effects. Does anyone know what a network effect is? Have you learned that here? Yeah? What's a network effect? It's when the, the product gets more value based on the more people that use it. Very true. So if I have a phone and no one else in this room has one or no one else on the planet has one, does that phone do me any good? No. Who can call me? Whom can I call? What's the point? But let's say that you and I have a phone. We can call each other. Okay, so it has a lot more utility. Let's say that everyone in this room can call each other. Again, exponentially more utility. And what if everyone on ASU campus or everyone in the world can? Tremendous utility. And when I was researching this, bo this book, I came across something called Metcalfe's Law. At a high level, it's this optimistic statement about connectedness. And to put it simply, the more people in your network, the more valuable it is. But it isn't a linear relationship. In other words, if I have one person in the network and I go to two, it isn't necessarily twice as valuable. Right? It starts to go up exponentially. Remember before when I talked about Jeff Bezos understanding at the beginning of the internet, or really the World Wide Web, that it was growing at 2,800% a year? It's only going to stay small for so long before it's going to be huge. So it effectively doubles. With, with when, users, when users double, it increases exponentially. Or, if you like graphs, and I do, according to Metcalfe's law, little things become big things really quickly. When one of you mentioned before, when I mentioned the five most valuable companies, someone said Twitter, I said not even close. Anyone know how many active users are on Twitter? Monthly active users, they claim. They say about 310 million. I sincerely doubt that because there are a ton of bots on Twitter. Right, again, Twitter fails the mom test, but let's say that it's 150 million users. Anyone know what it is on Facebook these days? I think they just cracked 2 billion. Right? So by having 6 or 10 times the number of users that Twitter has, Facebook isn't 6 or 10 times more valuable. Twitter, last time I checked, is worth about $12 billion and Facebook's worth about 300. So despite the fact that they have, let's call it 6 times as many users, it's worth, what, tw 25 times as much? Metcalfe's Law in Action. Now, this is all abstract, right? I mentioned before about Amazon adding planks to its platform. Well, in 1998, and I was around, anyone know what search was like in 1998? Would you get what you wanted on the first, front, on the first page? Was it typically the first result? Someone say no. Search was terrible in 1998. You often would not get anything close to what you wanted. Right? Yahoo, All the Web, uh, what was it? Ask Jeeves, AltaVista, uh, Lycos from Carnegie Mellon. That actually wasn't too bad. I went to Carnegie Mellon, so I have to give it some props. Anyway, in 1998, Google was a very powerful, very profitable search engine. But it wasn't a platform. I could only search on it. Remember, the way I'm defining a platform Developers can do things with it. Google was not a platform. 
So why change, right? You're making a ton of money on search. Why embrace platform thinking? Anyone know? Sorry? Make even more money. Okay, make even more money. I like that. Uh, and that's certainly true. But Google is paranoid about something. Disruption. Anyone here ever heard of the Clayton Christensen book, The Innovator's Dilemma? No? All right. Who here owns a Kodak product? What's Kodak, right? You do? I probably have an unopened disposable camera somewhere in the world. Okay. Lost under the bed. Right. So, to your knowledge, you're not using a Kodak product every day. Who here takes a picture every day? How many pictures get put on Instagram every day? It's some insane number, right? So, the Google guys understood that disruption is inevitable. Back around 1975, if I said, who here has a Kodak product, it would have been like, who here has a smartphone? Everyone would have said yes, right? Now, interestingly, in I think it was 1975, someone at Kodak invented the technology behind digital imaging. Yet Kodak is basically irrelevant. Uh, irrelevant. Apple, I believe, a couple years ago was going to buy it for its patents. So think about it. You work at Kodak in, in 1975. Kodak's making a ton of money. And you raise your hand and say, I have an idea for digital imagery, digital pho photography, right? Can anyone see why they didn't appreciate the value of that? I'll give you a better example. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, no one would recognize them for it. Or it could cannibalize their business, right? We're making a ton of money on old school film. Why do you want to rock the boat? I'll give you a better example. Um, who here is a Netflix customer? Okay, some of you. In 2000, when the dot-com bubble was starting to burst, Blockbuster could have bought Netflix for $50 million. And at the time, Blockbuster was worth a hell of a lot more than that. So why not buy it, right? Because Blockbuster thought that you would always want to go into a video store. At one point, Blockbuster made something like 65% of its revenue from late fees. So they could not conceive of a world without video stores, right? Who here has been to a Blockbuster in the last three years? They're out of business, right? You can even drive by the stores and you'll see the, the, right, the, the dirt with the sign. Right? So they understand this nature of disruption. In The Innovator's Dilemma, Clayton Christensen writes about that companies are a victim of their own success. In 1998, I believe, guess what percentage of devices that connected to the World Wide Web ran some version of Microsoft Windows? Yeah, it's about 95%, good guess. Anyone know that number today? Devices that connect to the internet or the World Wide Web that run some version of Windows. 80. You're close. It was 22 about three years ago, and I guarantee it's a lot less because who here owns a Microsoft phone? I've met a few people who have Microsoft phones. Guess where one of them worked? Guess what another one paid for her Microsoft phone? 49 cents. So the Google guys, Larry and Sergey, understood this notion of the innovator's dilemma. They understood what happened to Kodak, what, happened, what was happening to Blockbuster Video. Right? They knew that even though Microsoft was incredibly powerful with its Windows and Office um, franchises, if you wanted to run a startup, do you need to use a Microsoft product these days? No. You're going to run a Mac computer. right? There are open source applications, even operating systems, plenty of software out there. It used to be not that long ago that you couldn't even imagine booting up your computer without touching at least one Microsoft product. That's not true these days. So we know why Google was afraid of being disrupted. They understood that even if you do something really well, like search, eventually that could go away. You can do a lot of searches on Google. Can anyone name one search that you can't do on Google, one type of search? Right. I want to know which one of my friends in the last six months went to a Chinese restaurant in Manhattan and liked it. Try Googling that. Google and tell you that? Really? It's 
Perhaps if you write a review, but how do you know if your friends like it? Anyone here on Google Plus? Is, if you're Mark Zuckerberg, are you going to let Facebook index all that data? I'm, I, I'm sorry, are you going to let Google index all that data? Why would you? Right? There's this notion of social search. There are certain types of inquiries that you cannot do on Google. About, was it seven years ago now? I was thinking of buying a Mac. I'd been a Windows guy for years. And I could have Googled benefits of buying a Mac, Mac satisfaction, consumer reports, whatever. I didn't do that. I asked my friends on Facebook, thinking of buying a Mac. You guys know me pretty well. You think I'd like it? Within two hours, 20 of my friends said, you're a geek, you will love a Mac. And they were right. So that's revenue that could have gone to Google. Remember, Google makes its money primarily through advertising, right? AdWords, AdSense. So that's revenue that did not go to Google, that could have gone to Facebook, but really didn't go anywhere because I was asking my friends. Even mighty Google can be disrupted. Why do you think Google is not even Google anymore? It's Alphabet. It's undertaking all these moonshots, right? Like Calico, Google's trying to cure death, right? Anyone ever try Google Glass? Yeah, you like it? No. Yeah, neither did I. It was in a, a very crowded room and it wasn't picking up the voice, but Google understands that you have to make these bold bets if you want to be successful. You can't just assume, right, like Kodak, like Blockbuster, that just because a company was successful or an idea or a product means that it will continue to be successful. Right? So we know the rationale. Let's talk about how Google became a platform. Right? By launching different planks. Android, Google Mail, Google Play, YouTube. Billion dollars they paid for it in 2007. People thought they were crazy. Now it was a bargain. Google News, right? All of these different planks in Google platform, Google's platform. And I think it was 2012 when I was doing PR for the book, I noticed that Google was changing its privacy policy. In other words, there was no longer a separate one for Google Search and Gmail and YouTube, right? It was one universal policy. Well, that makes all the sense in the world, right? Because these are all part of Google. They're all planks in the same platform. This is why if you watch a video for anyone like the show Arrested Development, oh, such a funny show. But if I watch a video for that, I might see in Gmail, do you want to buy the new season of Arrested Development? They all talk to each other. So this is how Google became a true platform. How's that going? Pretty well. Again, it's not even Google anymore, it's Alphabet, but the stock has done very, very well. Now, um, I understand clickbait. I understand why books that promise the five steps to this or the seven ways to do that sell. I really do. But in truth, it's a lot more complicated, right? If everyone could go out and start the next Facebook or Instagram or even TweetDeck for $40 million, you would. In truth, there are a lot of different ways and there's a lot of luck involved. But I can say this. When building a platform, you don't necessarily have to be first, but you sure as hell cannot be last. Was Amazon the first place to buy a book online? What was before Amazon? Mm, no, they beat them to it. Amazon understood the importance of what they call first mover advantage. Get big fast. Amazon, for years, did not make a profit. People used to make fun of Jeff Bezos. Right? His favorite moniker when people made fun of Amazon was Amazon.org because it was a nonprofit, when of course it wasn't. Right? So Bezos understood that if you can get really big really quickly and become the place not just to buy nonfiction books or crime books or whatever, any book online, that's where you'd go. So Amazon has historically eschewed profits. They don't care about making money. Right? And a lot of Wall Street folks don't understand this. Right? How can a company consistently not make money? I don't understand that either. Right? So Amazon believed in first mover advantage. I want to be the first to do something. Right? Has Apple ever been first to market with anything? Did Apple create the first iPod? I'm sorry, the first MP3 player with the iPod? No. Not even close. First tablet, was that the iPad? Nope. So Apple has never been first to market. What about Facebook? Was Facebook the first social network? It was not. What were some of the ones that preceded it? MySpace? MySpace? I, 
No one here remembers Friendster. Such a powerful idea, but it was always down. Social networks are only good if you can actually, you know, use them and you couldn't use Friendster because it was so popular that they wound up crashing their, their servers. Right? So Facebook wasn't the first social network. Um, Social.net, I think, was. Reed Hoffman founded it. I want to say in 1999, but it didn't go anywhere. Also, I'd argue classmates.com was kind of a social network, right? So you don't necessarily have to be first, but you certainly can't be last. When Microsoft, and I want to say 2013, announced a social network, I think it was called SO.CL, I said, you, you've got to be kidding me, right? Another social network, that ship has sailed. Right? So you don't want to be last. For what? I think so. I'd have to look it up. It was, it was way after Twitter and LinkedIn and Facebook. I want to say 2013. I never heard of it. Yeah. I was definitely around. Okay. Doesn't surprise me. So rule number two, if you like, don't tick off developers. Now, there's another video that I didn't put in here, but very famously, Steve Ballmer used to be the uh, CEO of Microsoft. Now he's the owner of the LA Clippers was on stage and he's a really animated guy, right? Really big and sweaty and member of the Bald Brotherhood, right? And he's on stage screaming at a Microsoft conference, developers, 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 30, 50, 100 times you can Google it, right? Because he understood the importance of developers, particularly today, because they take your product and service in different directions, right? In a way, they externalize innovation. Think about it, you have all these people creating these different products, you don't know what's going to work. Well, what happens if you develop an app for iOS and it doesn't do well? Does that cost Amazon, I'm sorry, Apple any money? No. And if an app does blow up in your Apple, do you mind kicking 30% to people? No. Again, you're externalizing innovation. One of Twitter's many, many, many problems is that it has consistently irritated developers. I'm gonna talk about that in a second. They'll change the rules. They'll cut off access to the API. Developers are your friends. You make them mad. If you've got development chops, and a lot of you do, you think those skills are transferable to other quote unquote platforms or other programming languages? You better believe it. Right? So if I want to make it attractive for you, I can't just give you the tools. Right? Well, we've got a great SDK. You can tap into APIs. We've got a wonderful development community. Big deal. Are you offering people incentives? Right? In fact, at one point, BlackBerry, in a desperate attempt to remain relevant, was guaranteeing developers $10,000 if they'd build apps. And there were certain conditions to it, but they were so desperate and they were trying to court developers. There were only so many of them. Now, Twitter didn't always irritate developers. In fact, when Twitter started off, it was incredibly open. Remember, I threw you that stat about a million apps within the first two, three years? Right? So Twitter was so open, it accommodated developers. Over the last three to four years, Twitter has made the, plat um, the API a lot more closed. So there's this false notion that something is either open or closed. I'd argue that it's not a binary, it's a continuum. You can move on it left and right. And again, there's no one right way to do this. I was just teaching this in my uh, capstone course for CIS 440. Anyone know what percentage of devices Mobile devices run on Android worldwide? About 85. Good, it's about 85%. iOS is what? Well, we know it can't be greater than 15, right? iOS is about 12 and everyone else is fighting for crumbs. Android is incredibly open. Google Android fragmentation, it is insane. The number of devices, the number of different versions of Android. It's incredible how, I mean, we're talking about well over a thousand different versions of Android. It's open source, anyone can fork it. Anyone here ever have the Amazon Fire Phone? You did? No? I didn't think so. It didn't work out. But Amazon forked Android and ran its own version of it. Again, that's totally legitimate in the open source world. So Android is incredibly open. Is iOS open? You can jailbreak your phone, but good luck getting support with that. You cannot run iOS on another device, right? You have to have Apple. So the Apple ecosystem 
is in a way much more closed. Now, some people like that, right? I know that if I develop an app, it only has to run on iOS, what are we up to, 10, right? Most people are on, I think, 75, 80% are on 10, maybe a few stragglers on nine and eight. But if you create something for Android, are you confident that's gonna work on all these different devices and all these different operating systems? No. So for that reason, and the fact that many times iOS users are more inclined to pay for an app, developers flock to the place with 12% as opposed to the place with 85. That doesn't mean that one is good or bad or one is right, is wrong, right and wrong. The point is that there are different ways to build a platform. You don't have to be a first mover. You don't have to be closed. Generally speaking, though, as I look at companies, they start off really open because I want all of you to develop, right? If I made it really closed at the beginning, you go, well, I don't want to put up with that. Well, then you're going to go someplace else. Right? So generally speaking, it starts off as open. A few notes on platforms then and now because I am old enough to remember when I wouldn't have called them platforms per se, but you technically could develop other applications. Going back to the 1990s, the systems were much more closed. Right? Partnerships were limited. I spent about a decade as a consultant. Right? So I might build an access database or some sort of tool that would communicate with an enterprise system. But I couldn't sell it to other companies. I could go in there and offer myself as a service and I'd set something up, but I couldn't set up an app store or anything like it. Well, for a long time now, we're living in a very different age, right? Things are much more open. We've got people taking different devices and services in totally different directions. In other words, in what I'll call the pre-platform age, you had this notion of VARs, value-added resellers. Things were much more contained. You didn't have to worry about people doing crazy things. You didn't have open APIs. You didn't have these open development kits. And you didn't have uh, repositories like GitHub. Right? Things were much more controlled. Now, little things become big things really quickly. What was it? Within, what was it, a week of that, um, the launch of the Pokemon app? Did it have something obscene like 500 million downloads within a week? You didn't see that type of speed back then. You didn't see the sorts of partnerships that we see now. It's, it's incredible to me how there's this notion, has anyone ever heard the term frenemies? Right? You're kind of friends with your coopetition, right? You're kind of doing business with companies that are out to get you in a way, right? Yahoo, I believe runs, um, was it, I'm sorry, wasn't it um, Bing as its search engine now? So you have companies that historically had competed with each other now cooperating. The collaboration, I'd argue that it used to be much more contentious, right? Fixed pie, competition based. These times, again, Apple is completely comfortable giving you 70% of the royalties. If you sell your ebook on Amazon, it's the same kind of cut. Amanda Hawking, the woman I mentioned before, the self publishing superstar, actually had to think about whether she wanted to go with traditional publishers because she's not making 70% with a traditional publisher, especially when they're fronting her $2 million. Right. Innovation used to be very top down, internal or via acquisition, very, very slow. Right? You weren't giving developers the keys to your kingdoms. You weren't letting them take your product in different directions. In fact, it wasn't uncommon for there to be lawsuits. Now. You can't do everything, right? Apple shut down, what was it, that Path app a couple years ago because they were pulling data from people's contact books and Apple doesn't like that, right? Apple isn't Google or Alphabet. Apple is trying to sell privacy as a feature, right? What did Tim Cook say, was it about six months ago? Right? He says, we're not in the data business. We're not, in so many words, we're not Facebook, we're not Google. We're not trying to monetize your data, right? Why? They don't need to. Anyone know Apple's profit margins? About 40%. It's insane. It's incredibly high. So Apple doesn't need to do that. No, so I'll end up with a few um, lessons and predictions, and then I'm, I'm happy to take some questions. Um, I think there's a lot that all companies can learn from this. Um, embracing their principles. No, you can't do what Google does if you started a small company or a startup. But remember, companies like Amazon and, Am and Apple at one point could not do what they did today. And they're doing things now that they, won't, they can't do. I'm sorry, they'll be doing things in 10 years that they're unable to do today. I also think that companies that embrace this type of thinking will continue to disrupt other industries. 
Uber doesn't let you develop things on it per se, but trust me, Uber understands the importance of an API. Right? In fact, with Facebook, you can uh, dial up an Uber, right? How do you think those things are talking to each other? APIs, right? In fact, many companies have started developing proprietary APIs. They don't want them open to everyone. They just want them open to internal people. Again, it's not like I can build something on top of Airbnb, but Airbnb wants to play nice with smartphones, with social networks, right? So these are companies that understand the power of platform thinking and certainly multi-sided markets, right? Who here has ever taken an Uber? Who here has ever driven for Uber? Nobody? Yeah. So again, this no same thing with Airbnb, right? I can rent out a room in my home or I can stay. Has anyone ever stayed through an Airbnb before? Okay. So it's this notion that people can do different things with our core product and offering. To me, that really resonates with platform thinking. Again, I could be wrong. I'm wrong about a lot of things, but I think that generally speaking, companies that embrace this type of thinking will do better than companies that don't. Stuart Brand said in 1972 that information wants to be free. Take a look at the news, you see all these hacks, all these leaks, right? things get out there. So that's my story and I'm sticking to it. If you want to find out about me, I'm over in the Carey School or you can read about my nonsense on uh, philsimon.com, but um, I'll take any questions that people have. Um, Chris, did you have the microphone? Okay. You gotta switch yours off. Okay. This is good? Yep. Pass it around if you've got a question. Okay. Does it have to be just like this? <laughs> it really doesn't work if I do this. You can hear me, right? That's a little loud, that's all. Ah. I'm sure it's not too close, that's all. Not too close. All right. Questions, anyone? Thoughts? Yeah. Um, so should I, should I give the microphone and then take it back? Is that how we're doing this? Okay. I'm fond of, for those of you who didn't hear, the question was what, what platform would be dominant, say, 10 years from now? Um, the short answer is I don't know, but I'm fond of the words of Mark Andreessen when asked a similar question. Does anyone know who Mark Andreessen is? Okay. VC, Andreessen Horowitz. Right. Yeah, he's one of the most successful VCs out there. He's, even before then, he was the guy who invented Mosaic, which was the first web browser. Because the internet's existed since, I think, 1969. So it used to be DARPAnet. It was a government defense project. But it was only available, really, to academics. There was no visual or GUI, right? So when asked a similar question, he basically said, I don't know the next successful company. But it's not going to be another search engine. It's not going to be another social network. Those ships have sailed. If you look at where a lot of money is going, you know, I, I don't know if you want to call artificial intelligence a platform. But I think that in 10 years, we'll see driverless cars, um, artificial intelligence, right? machine learning, some of the things you're probably studying here. Now, are there ways to embrace platform thinking and doing that? Sure. Who here has heard of IBM Watson? Right. Well, Watson, if you haven't heard of it, beat um, two of the most prominent Jeopardy champions it's about five years ago. It effectively read Wikipedia and was able to answer questions. So they are allowing developers to get in on that action because if I can learn things, look at patterns, understand data, one of my books is about big data, then that in theory can be enormously valuable. Um, I'm sure that it won't be a linear path, but anyone here know who Ray Kurzweil is? Really smart guy. Um, he invented the first electronic keyboard, I believe, in 74, 75. Um, these days he works for Google and it's artificial, or Alphabet, and it's artificial intelligence lab. 
Kurzweil has made some really crazy predictions over the years. In, I think it was 1984, he said that the Soviet Union would fall because of economic issues, and he was right. In 1989, it fell. He also predicted in, I want to say, 1990, that by 98, a computer would beat the world's best chess player. People said he was crazy, and he was wrong. It happened three years before. Kurzweil, who wrote a book called The Singularity, or The Singularity is Neil, believes that by 2040, man will be fused with machine. And when he looks at one of the things I mentioned before, exponential growth, and he sees something that's at 1% now, people don't pay attention to it, right? Well, if it's growing exponentially, what is it next year? Two. What is it the year after that? Four, eight, 16, 32. Little things become big things. I cannot predict the future. I'm not that smart. And if I did, <laughs> be playing the lottery and working in the stock market. But if you look where a lot of the money is going, artificial intelligence, um, augmented reality, virtual reality. I mean, Facebook paid $1.9 billion for Oculus for a reason. I think it's only a matter of time for that happens. But I mean, who would predict this stuff? Who would predict that Amazon in 2006 would ask itself a fundamental question. Remember, this was primarily a retailer. Well, we generate a lot of compute power, right? We've got all these servers and data centers. We don't need it all. Where does it go? It vanishes it into the ether. We waste it. Did anyone know what that idea became? Amazon Web Services. AWS. Anyone know what Amazon Web Services is doing now for annual revenue? About 15 billion. So ideas are going to come from crazy places. If you told Bezos that, forget 1995 when he started the company, even 2003, 2004, that you would make not most of your sales, but most of your profits from cloud computing, how does that happen? No. I wish I could predict the future, but I think those three areas that I named are promising. Whether or not they become true platforms, I, I have no idea. And ultimately, look, it, it doesn't matter. right? I get annoyed when I hear people call themselves platforms because they don't do anything near what Amazon, Apple, Facebook, and Google do. And I'm not just talking about scale, scale I'm talking about conceptually, right? There's nothing wrong with non-platform businesses, right? I just think that those that take advantage of the skills that people like you have and the technologies that are out there will be able to conceive of things that no one would have possibly imagined. Any other questions? Yes. Yes, to the classic companies with partnerships like Uber or Airbnb, if a company could just thrive on a private API, is it still called a platform? What, I'm sorry, what about private APIs? Uh, why do you call a company with a private API as a platform company? Because they are going to let, the, the question if you those who didn't hear it, why would I call a company with a proprietary or a private API a platform? Well, if uh, IBM, has developed some proprietary platforms, maybe for its clients, maybe internally. They are letting certain people develop it. It just isn't necessarily the open platform that, say, Google would be or iOS would be. I mean, when you think about it, iOS isn't even that open. iOS rejects apps all the time, right? They violate privacy services if there are certain types of apps that Apple just doesn't want there, right? Apple doesn't want you to download porn apps. So it's not totally open in that sense. It's embracing platform thinking, but it goes back to something I said before. It's a matter of degree. It doesn't have to be the choice between completely open, anyone can do everything, or so locked down that only three people can do something, right? There are degrees. I, it, platform doesn't need, uh, an API doesn't necessarily need to be open. There may be reasons, right? Uber doesn't, Netflix is a great example, right? Why can't you build anything on top of Netflix? They don't have the right to package things. Right? They're concerned about copyright, right? On YouTube, they've made it a lot easier over the years to report a copyright claim, right? So if you're Netflix and you're paying, Netflix contact acquisition costs are about $3.5 billion per year. They spend a ton of money either producing shows like House of Cards. Anyone knows how much House of Cards cost Netflix year one? $100 million. 
They spend a ton of money on original content. They could find themselves in a lot of trouble or maybe they use, lose revenue. They, it's not like they couldn't figure out different things to do with it. There are reasons for them not wanting you to create a new app that uses content that they don't have the rights to use in a particular way. Right? So not every API needs to be totally open. In some cases, there are completely reasonable uses. But you're going to get, generally speaking, more of everything, more good apps, right? I mean, if you like Angry Birds, two billion times, and you get a bunch of things that make no sense. Anyone here a couple years ago about that app? It was supposed to be the Yelp for people. It was called People, P-E-E-P-L-E. -E -E. Anyone remember that one? Like, they pulled it within, I think, two weeks, not because it violated terms of service, but because the user reviews were so negative. Right? They'd say, I don't like Britney, and I'm going to slam you all over it. It was just a way of just talking trash about people. So you get good ideas, and you get terrible ideas, and you get a bunch in between. Any other thoughts, questions, comments? Yes? I'll go. I'll see you this. So also for IBM's Watson, their APIs are Bluemix, and they're doing some crazy stuff. You can do like natural language processing super easily. But I was, had a question about an emerging platform on the Internet of Things. And currently, the landscape looks like a lot of different people, some big players too, like Intel, that really can't get firm footing because they're, they're not too developer friendly. And, but I think on a deeper level, CS people come out of college knowing APIs and, and the standard interfaces. But with hardware, there's not really a population of people who are familiar with developing for that platform. What are your thoughts on the Internet of Things for making a platform that operates differently than the APIs of the normal Internet age? Okay. Let me unpack a lot in that question. Um, ASU has a number of agreements with companies. Right? So for my students, if they want to get on AWS, do they have to pay? What do you think? No, why not? Sorry? Okay, and there's students. Why not charge students? You got enough money to go here, right? right? It's a Trojan horse. If I can get developers, I'm sorry, students using AWS, right, and you go to work at a company, and a company runs an on premise Oracle database, and they spend a ton of money, right, and they don't like paying the support fees, right? Typically, at least on the software side for Oracle, if you spend, say, $2 million on an Oracle license, you're going to pay about 22% per year to support it, so about $440,000. Right? And what if you don't use it? Right? What if it's uh, what they call shelfware? In other words, you bought it, you pay for it, but you don't use it. Well, with AWS, with its pricing model, my students were presenting in their capstone courses today, some of them are using AWS, you pay for it as long as you use it. If you use it for 37.2 minutes in a day, that's what they charge you. You're not paying those upfront costs. So let's go back to Amazon. Why do they want students using it? Because you go into companies and you go, you know what? I used AWS. You can do this. It's a lot more powerful. Developers are building things on it. And it's a lot less expensive. Right? Trojan horse. Right? And Amazon isn't alone. A lot of companies have licenses, Tableau software, data visualization, and there are a bunch of other different ones. So there's a benefit to getting you guys on their products for free, even though when you graduate and work, you can't use it for free anymore. With regard to the Internet of Things, I find it fascinating. Um, Cisco predicted that by 2020, 50 billion devices will be connected. There are around 7.5 billion people on Earth. Do the math. That would mean that the average person has seven connected devices. I just got a wireless picture frame. Um, there are incredible possibilities, but there are a number of challenges there. Who remembers that October hack that took down decent portions of the internet? Someone got in through a webcam. Right? We can't even lock down computers. Right? Com they've been with us for a long time. Do we really know all the protocols involved with wearable tech? What's more, there are no common standards. Anyone here ever been to the Consumer Electronics Show in Vegas? It is a trip. They have 35 cubic football fields worth of vendors. It is insane. Right? It, I went there 2012 for the first time. 
and it was all full of energy and I want to see where everything's going. And I said I'd spend two, maybe three days there. Spent eight hours day, there. Next day slept the entire day. It was so exhausting. The next year I went there for four hours, same thing the next year too. You see all these vendors with all these different ideas. The problem is that these things don't talk to each other, right? Not to mention the security issue. So very few people want to go home and fiddle with their settings, right? I'd argue, and I'm an Apple person, I'm not anti-Windows or anti-Android, uh, but I like the fact that if I buy Apple TV and I connect to my home network, all my iTunes library is there, right? I don't want to mess with it. I like the fact that with, say, Netflix, when I get a new device, I log into Netflix and my whole history is there. Amazon, if, you have, if you're reading, a, who here has a Kindle? If you're reading a book on your Kindle, and let's say you don't bring it with you, but you're uh, online at a food store and you want to bring up that book and you read, right? and you go five or six pages, what happens when you go back to your Kindle? Does it know where you are? Right. So people want convenience. Right? I'm not certain. I'm sure it'll get better, but given the security concerns and the fact that this stuff just doesn't talk to each other, do we really want to spend our time trying to figure this stuff out, especially when it's not that there's security? Now, eventually, I'm sure that we'll get there because I'm old enough to remember in 1992 at Carnegie Mellon when I could get an email from someone at Carnegie Mellon, but not someone who went to a different school. Eventually, they figured out the protocols, and now it doesn't matter if you go to school or not in school. I can send an email to anyone with that email address, and it's been that way for a long time. I have very little doubt that we will figure it out. With regard to Intel, I agree with you. They haven't necessarily been a quote-unquote platform for developers. Maybe that winds up changing. But again, let's go back to Innovator's Dilemma. Why did Intel two weeks ago drop $15 billion for that Israeli um, driverless car company? Right? Well, how has Intel made most of its money over the years? Right, chips, processing. Moore's Law, compute power doubles every 18 months, give or take. Well, we are nearing the end, people say, of Moore's Law. Right? So what's the future? Is it going to be making money from selling laptops and desktops? No. If you go to countries like Africa, you have people who don't even connect through a proper computer. They connect through smartphones, right? So if you're Intel, you have to figure out what's next. And that means making a big bet. For all I know, that it's a tremendous waste of money. But if they're right, then they could be on the ground floor of something that could be revolutionary. The point is, I understand why Mike, uh, Mark Zuckerberg spends, what was it, $19 billion for WhatsApp or a billion dollars for Instagram. Instagram, people say Instagram makes more money for Facebook than Twitter makes. And Twitter's valuation is, what, $15 billion? At one point, it was about three times higher. So I'd argue that you need to make bold bets. You can't just make something a little bit better. If you look at the Google guys, in 1998, they didn't want to make search 10% better. They wanted to make it 10 times better. We're talking about orders of magnitude. Now, this is why, particularly in this country, it isn't true everywhere, we encourage that kind of entrepreneurism. Right? We know that most startups aren't going to work. Andreessen himself, he'll fund 10 companies knowing that nine of them will fail. But hopefully that 10 pays for the other 9. But yeah, Internet of Things, um, it's definitely coming. Uh, but until we have common standards and can figure out security, I'm not sure that people are going to want to spend most of their time messing around with stuff. I think, how are we doing on time? Maybe one more question? Or? Yes. A platform is like a uh, multi-sided. Is it true? Is it right? And what if like a Yelp, people write something and other people can read something? Is that a platform? And uh, one more. And like an iPhone or laptop, also people can communicate with each other. Is like a multi, like a platform or something like that? Uh Go to the first, uh, first question first. Um, I don't see how Yelp is a platform. What can I build on top of it? Just because I can comment right, on a review. I mean, it's valuable information. Most small businesses really pay attention to that. I was just uh, in my 450 Enterprise Analytics capstone course doing an exercise with my students. Amazon is suing over 2,000 people for posting fake reviews. Why? 
When you think about buying something, do you check out product reviews first? Who, show of hands. Yeah, most people do. About 85% of people do. So if those sites like Five Air were letting people pay for reviews, right? so for five bucks, if you want, I, I'd say I'm a new author, right? No one's reviewed my book. Hey, I'll give you five bucks. Copy and paste this in there. Yeah, sure, five bucks. That was happening many, many times, and it was corrupting the quality of the reviews. Right? Yelp has, in a way, the same problem, but if people are Googling, right, and they Google, people use Android and YouTube and Gmail and all of them, again, these companies have made these, some would say, crazy acquisitions because it's one-stop shopping. If you're Yelp, you're kind of a one-trick pony, right? What else are you doing, right? We see this with, who here is on Foursquare? No one? Okay. Foursquare is, is fascinating. Right now I'm working on a book on analytics, and it starts off by telling the story of how Chipotle had some salmonella scares, right? It was 53 people got sick, right? Chipotle, through check-ins on Foursquare, knew that its sales were going to be 30% lower. Foursquare knew it too. But Foursquare was, again, just for check-ins, right? In fact, Foursquare, a couple years ago, split its app into, what was it, Swarm, for kind of the social aspect and just check-ins. Foursquare had been struggling. They just took money, I want to say a year ago, at roughly half of their previous evaluation. They called it a down round. Not good. Right? So Foursquare is trying to get away from just being, oh yeah, the check-in app, right? In fact, if you go to foursquare.com or its Medium feed or its Twitter feed, they don't brand themselves as a check-in app. You know what they brand themselves as? A location intelligence company. Go back to what I said about Chipotle, right? Think about it. If you ran a hedge fund, and you could know by virtue of what they call data exhaust, I know which people check in, right? You could use that information to either bet on a stock or short a stock, right? You'd have that information before Wall Street did and they post their results. So Foursquare is trying to change from kind of a Yelp model of, oh yeah, we do customer reviews or we do check-ins, to being a data company. You, if you go on Medium for Foursquare, you can read blog posts that show these incredible visualizations about how they know what people are doing. And they're trying to sell that to companies. So within, what, five years, there was a company that was trying to market it, give itself away to free so you check in and they could get small businesses to sell ads. Because what was the alternative, right? Sitting outside a pub here in Tempe going, two for one specials, who wants them, right? Well, I'm walking by with my headphones, right? I don't want to be bothered, I'm, I'm on my phone, right? Well, imagine their, their, their model was what if I could send someone something because I know your location. I go, hey, you're in the area. I don't want to bother you, but we're having a two-for-one appetizer special. And you might go, you know what? I am kind of hungry. That's a good deal. Right? Well, that wasn't going so well for them. So they, I don't like the term, but they are quote-unquote pivoting right, to try to be something other than that. And instead of being a, again, another term that I don't like, but B2C company. They're trying to be a B2B or business-to-business -business company because companies will pay for that intelligence. There's a huge demand for that. They have this incredible real-time data. They know what's happening right now. They can capture this data exhaust. Yelp is really ticked off at Google because most people, will, when they're searching for reviews, unless you go to that app, if you're Google, why are you going to promote Yelp reviews? Can you review something on Google Places? So why would I funnel things to competition? Now, a lot of governments don't like that. Google's faced a number of lawsuits, particularly in the uh, European Union, because of privacy statutes. But again, this notion of frenemies, right? If you ran Google, would you really want to promote other people's products and services? Microsoft saw this with Expedia. You're promoting Microsoft stuff first. Well, yeah. <laughs> Why would I promote something else? Uh, I'm sorry, what was your second question again? You know, I wouldn't call a product a platform because Apple makes a bunch of different products. Fundamentally, they're using a lot of the same technologies. Who here knows, knows about a unified code base? Right? Siri, they just put in uh, Mac Sierra. Right? You couldn't do that with the previous version. Right? Well, Siri was for the phone. Right? Why are these code bases converging? Right? Maybe at some point in the future, iOS, and they used to call it um, OS X, now they call it Mac OS. Right? You can't tell me that they don't share some of the same code. Why wouldn't you, right? So I wouldn't call a product a platform. Um, I know when I did um, uh, one of my pieces for, I think it was Inc., 
don't, and the, they, they pick these titles that are supposed to be link bait, right? The five ways to do this, the seven ways to do that. And sometimes I'll bite, right? Yeah, I want to see which celebrities have had plastic surgery this year, right? The title of the article is Don't Make Products Make Platforms. Well, I think that's silly, right? You're not buying a platform, right? Well, I'm going to call you on my platform. Let me text you. That's silly, right? Now, I'd argue, again, getting back to big P and little p, the platform is the business model. Google is using information to serve you up the right videos or the right ads because that's how it makes money. Right? Ditto for Facebook. Um, I think they understand that they need to have their product on other platforms. We can talk a lot about that. I can run, this to me is fascinating, right? I can take out my iPhone, right? And I can talk into Siri, and Siri usually gets it wrong. But I can Google search something that might take me to an Amazon page, and I might recommend that to friends on Facebook. I'm using all these quote unquote platforms at the same time on the same device. Right? If you're Android, Google's, one of Google's biggest competitors is Facebook. Digital advertising is basically a two horse race between Google and between Facebook. Who here has, a, has an Android phone? You got a Facebook app for that? Would you buy an Android phone if you could not run Facebook on it? You're thinking. It'd be rough, right? So think about this notion of frenemies. For all I know, by owning an Android phone, I could be clicking on Facebook ads and I'm using Google slash Alphabet to make money for Facebook. It's an incredibly complicated world. I liken it to the Cold War. It used to be 30 years ago, we knew we were the good guys and the, the Soviets were the bad guys and vice versa, right? It was all black and white. Now, the, the alliances are so complicated. Well, we're kind of allies with this country against that country, but not if it's this country. I mean, uh, I think it was, um, was it Lenin or Khrushchev who said, the enemy of my enemy is my friend? So we see all these crazy technology alliances. Right, when the net neutrality was coming up about, what, two years ago, one year ago, right? We saw all these tech companies that competed with each other a lot. Right? They think that the internet is a good thing and there should not be a fast lane, right? And tech companies as well, I certainly don't want to get all political here, but we're finding that they are very much on the same page when it comes to immigration, when it comes to some of the policies that are coming out of Washington now. So it is a fascinating time. Um, I don't have a lot of confidence in a company that just does one thing, because if that one thing goes away, if there's a new customer review site and Yelp is still Yelp, I just don't see how it's going to grow, right? What is going to happen that's going to make Yelp twice as big as it is now? Is Yelp making any big bets on the future, the way that Google is, the way that Facebook is? Amazon, I mean, Amazon, my gosh, you want to talk about a company with an incredible time horizon, right? Investors have given Jeff Bezos an incredible amount of leeway. Right? Yeah, you'll make money whenever. <laughs> I mean, for a company that's worth so much, to, to have so few profitable quarters is astonishing to me. So you can get away with crazy things uh, in some cases, but other times companies won't, aren't allowed to do that. I, I don't think that Yelp has anywhere near the leash. And I understand why in the case of Foursquare, they're almost saying, you know what, this may not work. But we can't, what's the point in just kind of dripping, dripping away, right? What if we do something totally crazy and become a loca location intelligence company? There could be real money in that. So I give them credit for making bets. But um, if you're not making crazy bets, some people would say you're complacent. Um, maybe one more question if we have it. Yeah. Can you explain all the terms that you don't like? like the <laughs> Uh, it's a long list. Um, my, my most recent book is called Message Not Received, but I got a bunch of them. I mean, it, things just get so bastardized. Uh, platforms up there, um, oh, if anyone ever says net net, my skin just crawls. Um, I, I mean, look, why is there so much jargon? All right, trivia time. If you Google something, do you know what percentage of hits go to that top result? on average? 35. Right? It's a classic power law. And it drops off considerably after that. Right? So if you're on the second page, unless your name is Kim Kardashian, you're not getting a lot of traffic. right? So how do you overcome that? Well, how can you get to the top of Google? Two ways. 
What's the first? Keywords. Keywords. So you pay for it. And some drug companies will pay, I'm not kidding, $500 per click because they're selling a $30,000 drug for such a rare disease that if you click on it and you buy it, it's actually worth $500 to them. So you can buy it. What's the other way to get to the top of Google? Traffic. Traffic. Organic, right? Free. Which is the better way? I'd rather do it for free, right? So, how does this relate to jargon? Because if I'm creating a new spreadsheet application and I'm Googling spreadsheet, what's going to show up number one? Google Well, on Google probably. <laughs> Not on Bing. That Right, Excel, right, okay. So, why am I trying to compete with something when it's already taken, right? Why is, oh gosh, uh, this was a terrible one. Um, Computer Science Corporation, and I want to say 2014, announced that it had launched this, and I'm not making it up, its new uh, big data platform as a service. What? I wrote a book about big data. I wrote a book about platforms. I know what as a service means. I understand why they did it, right? Because if it's big data as a service, that's taken. But, but this was actually next generation big data platform as a service, right? It means nothing, right? Now, why do they do it? Because if you Google that term, guess what? You're number one. But who's going to Google that term and what do people mean? Maybe three months after I saw that press release, I was in Vegas at a conference and I ran into a guy from CSC at a booth. And I said, oh yeah, you guys launched that big data platform as a service, right? Or BDPAAS, right? Just, just a natural acronym, right? I said, yeah, interesting. And he was so excited that I knew about this new offering. So I said, how many customers do you have? He didn't like the question. He said, well, it depends on what you mean by customer. All right, I can make it simpler. Does anyone pay you to use it? <laughs> well, not in that sense. So why would you buy something if you don't understand it? I don't think there's, there's anything wrong with plain, simple language. Einstein said, if you can't explain it simply, then you don't understand it well enough. And look, I understand that there are certain pieces of uh, technical jargon, right? If you're a doctor and you're talking about intubating a patient using all these words that a lay person like myself wouldn't understand, well, that makes sense because you're communicating, right? If you're a doctor and I'm a doctor and we're operating on you over a table or a surgeon, right? We don't have time to break it down, right? That jargon means something. We're communicating. The word communicating at its core means to make common. If I don't know what big data platform as a service is, right? How am I making that common? How am I understanding? How are you communicating with me? So I'm of the belief that there's nothing wrong with simplicity. You will get to a point at which you're dealing with someone in your careers who is a Java expert, who codes in C++, and you're using these technical terms. But it isn't jargon because you're really communicating. Uh, but I see how a lot of the people in the business world are creating these terms and it's just jargon. And they think that they're sounding smart because they'll say utilize instead of use. Right? It's somewhere along the line, people got it in their head that more syllables are better. Uh, there was a famous essay from 1949 from George, um, was it George or I think it was George Orwell, about how you should never use a big uh, word when a small word will suffice. You can certainly be articulate. I like to think that I've got a decent vocabulary. But I tend to think that when you're using that kind of jargon, you're either making people feel stupid or you're trying to make yourself feel smart. If you can communicate well and in a language that people understand, then hopefully you're we perceive that way. But yeah, it's, it's, a very, it's a very long list there. I think it's Appendix 3A of that book. I just said, you know what? I need a table of all the things uh, because it's, just, it's unnecessary. I mean, it, the world is changing so quickly, right? No, the tweet is a verb. Friend is a verb. I'll friend you on Facebook, right? And language has always changed. I was astonished researching that book and I read a lot, to know that certain verbs that we take for granted these days used to be considered improper or jargon, right? They say, I'm going to contact you. Whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> Slow down there, Sparky. What's that? Or I'm going to interact with you. So language changes, but when things change so quickly, it's nice to know that certain things kind of stay the same. 
And if you don't, people don't understand what you're talking about with next generation big data platform and services, throw a bunch of things in there that might be good from an SEO standpoint, but not good from a communication or human standpoint, I, I don't see how that makes you smart, right? I just, I, I don't see what's wrong with, with simplicity. Well, I'll do this. Um, I will hang out in case anyone has any other questions, but I want to thank you for your time and attention.